interview time and we are here with Orpheus Black and uh, uh, if you are not watching on YouTube I highly recommend going and checking out the Shameless Sex Podcast YouTube because we have some videos that are going there and you can see Orpheus is a beautiful room there's some paddles and floggers on the wall next to the bed <laughs> Orpheus layer Ooh, <laughs> yeah some magic happens in there it's and like today, a sexy yeah. bat cave over there yes yeah, yeah, <laughs> I want to go into your sexy bat cave so this episode you already heard a little bit in the bio we are going to talk more about dominance how to step into a more dominant role specifically spoken to, to and towards um, penis owning individuals, uh, people who identify as men, etc. So, without further ado, we always start with the same prompt, Orpheus. Can you please tell us how you got to where you are today in the world of sexuality, both as a professional and in your personal life? Yeah, um, I got into this lifestyle because I was poly, right? And this is poly before anyone really knew what this was. There was no internet chat groups. There was no, there was no prompts to, or anything. And I had a partner who was into kink and I had no idea what kink was. And in fact, she left me for a dom. And I thought that the dude's name was Dom this whole time. I was like angry at some dude named Dom or Dominic or something like that, or Demetrius. And, um, when it didn't work out for them, she said, I want to introduce you into a lifestyle that I think would be absolutely amazing for you. And she took me to a dungeon. And, you know, it was in the goth industrial club. And I had no idea what goth was. Right. And so I show up. Of course, it's Hollywood in my hip hop outfit. You know, what I mean, the crush velour powder blue Georgetown Hoya sweatsuit and my my girls are matching outfits. And we show up. And the this first thing that happens, security's like, you know, this ain't hip hop. Right. This is not hip hop night. You probably want to go in a different direction. <laughs> I'm like, no, man, open up the door. I'm, I'm ready. I know what's going on. Just let me in. And they let me in. And I swear the whole club stopped. Not only are we the only black people in this place, we are the only people not wearing powder makeup, mohawks, eyeliner. You know, we're, we're in bright, vibrant colors, right? And, and to my left, I saw a man suspending a woman in a crucifix. He's standing six feet up, standing on her throat with a high heel. He's wearing, you know, all this feminine garb and, and, and she's loving it. And I think to myself, yeah, I could do that. <laughs> and ever since then, I never looked back. So I came in as a professional. I started training immediately that week. I, I, the person who was choking that woman with her high heel would become my mentor and one of my best friends uh, of all this time. And so for me, that was my introduction into this lifestyle. And I've never done anything other than this for 20 years. I think you might want to do voiceover because you have a fantastic voice and you're a great storyteller. I can tell you like doing voiceover stuff. I'm like, oh, I felt like I was there at that club, the, the gothic club with you and the velour. Ugh, I still, I wear a lot of crushed velvet still, okay? <laughs> I love myself some crushed velvet. <laughs> so, we need to see pictures. We okay, need to see pictures. I, I, <laughs> probably last Friday I had some crushed velvet on. So don't, don't hate me for that. I love it. So, okay, so... What if, uh, so, okay, sorry, let me backtrack. What is the difference, first of all, between a lifestyle dom and a professional dom? And how does being a lifestyle dom show up in relationships? Mm, that's a really good question. How does being a lifestyle dom differ than being a pro dom? You know, first of all, we get paid. That's, that's, that's the major thing, right? And also the financial motivation is really the reason that those two people are engaging. For me, um, it is not about uh, my own personal enjoyment, what I derive from it. It's about that person's experience. I'm a facilitator in that space. A person comes to me looking for a very specific experience, right? We talk, we negotiate, we create safe words, we create safe containers, and then we move into a space of facilitating their experience. I shelve my desire so that they can have this opportunity. When we're talking about lifestyle people, what we're doing is something that's mutually beneficial. We're looking for some mutual joy, mutual pleasure, mutual pain. Right. We're looking for mutual gratification. Both people are enacting something that is deeply connected to their sex, their sexuality and their joy. So for me, that's the major differences. The also too, um, 
there's a lot of education that goes into being a pro dom. Now, anybody can call themselves a pro dom. Anybody can grab a flogger and charge a price. But when you're with a professional, we've taken classes, got mentorship. We, you know, first aid is another thing that, you know, people don't talk about a lot that I've taken and have to get recertified in. You know, uh, I was, a, I had first responder training as well in order to try and really uh, be the best person that I could for my clients. Right. Maybe that would be great for people in a lifestyle, but they often overlook certain things like mentorship and, and a lot of classes to really dive in. Usually they just start right in. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And so do you identify as both then in your personal life and in your your uh, professional. professional life? Oh, definitely. You know, here's the thing. Power dynamics are part of every facet. It doesn't matter whether it's boss secretary uh it doesn't matter if it's child parent it doesn't matter if it's police patron it doesn't matter there's always a power dynamic so in some ways we are all lifestyle dominance right or we're all lifestyle submissives we're because you're playing the subordinate role to your boss uh or to the contractor on the court or somewhere so uh somewhere out there you know or you're so in so the supportive role Supporting a boss, supporting someone else who's in charge, helping to make the dream come true. So there's never a time where we're not in the lifestyle, right? Yeah. It just re it's just whether it involves intimate behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And so what if some, I think a lot of our listeners might be, um, they might be ad more advanced in the kink world or in the world of dominance and submission. Um, and, but I think most of them are more in the beginner or slash intermediate. Maybe they have some curiosity. <laughs> so I'm, I want to ask about some th what you would recommend for someone who wants to get in more into their dominant power. They want to step forward into that. Whether maybe a partner has asked them and say, I want you to be more dominant. I really want more dominance in the bedroom. Or maybe they themselves want to step forward into that, but they don't feel like they've tapped into that part of themselves. Do you have any tips or ideas on how they can do that? Yeah. <clears throat> the first thing that I try and tell people about dominance is there's a difference between dominance and domineering, right? If you want to take a leadership role and pursue your sexuality, then do that. What is it that you want? Check your desires. Really resource yourself. Really examine what you want, how you want it, and who you want it from. Because that's really important. There's lots of things that I want to do, but I don't want to do that with everyone. Right. Maybe you don't want to do that with your wife or maybe you don't want to do. So really think about what you want to do with this person. Then think about how you want to step into power. Is it just in the bedroom? Right. Or is it more domestic? Do you want more domesticity around your uh, hey, I want my coffee served at this time and I would like you to wear this and I like you to dress like that. Maybe that's your kink. Right. Or maybe it's just smacking bottoms or or pulling hair. Maybe that's your kink. Whatever you're into is what's important. Right. So be dominant at what you want to do. You don't have to do it all. That's the first step. Bite sized goals. The other thing is really understanding what kink means. Kink is defined as any deviation from what you think is normal sexual behavior. Right. So. Here's an exercise that I like to do with all my clients, right? I'll say, you know, divide a paper in half and then divide it into fours. In the first column, what I want you to do is tell me what is normal sexual behavior. Now, most of the time you say, oh, blow jobs, hand jobs, uh, you know, rimming, whatever it is, right? The next question is, what do you do that is not or outside of normal sexual behavior? Because we all do something. Right. And so then we can see, oh, I am actually doing something <laughs> that I don't consider normal sexual behavior because kink is personal. It's subjective. It's not just flogging. It's just for me, flogging is normal. Look, I have it up in my room. <laughs> I have floggers. I got knives. I got fire over here. You know, I got vibrators everywhere. To me, that's normal. Right. So everyone's le level of deviation is different. Then I say, what is it that you want to do that you're not already doing? Right. The last category is why. What is the impediment keeping you from moving into that space? And if you look at it, the first one is in our, our indoctrination. 
the things that we've been told we're supposed to do by our parents or religion or whatever. But we always buck that in our teens and in our college years, right? And then we move into this other space of complete sexual expression. Your sexual expression, the way you do it, is kink. Right? Because it's different than what you've been told it's supposed to be. What you fantasize is your shadow. That's the thing you're struggling with incorporating. Some people might say, oh, uh, I want to do anal, but there's some religious taboos, or, you, or a person's going to think I'm dirty, or I don't know this, or I don't know that. All of that is your shadow. And it usually doesn't have language, pre-verbal. Right? You just have feelings about it. We have fear, we have scarcity, or we have shame, but we don't have language for it, right? And then we have all the excuses why we're not doing it. So for me, when you want to step into your dominance, start with accepting what you're already doing and improve on it. Look at your fantasies and start trying to bring language to it so you can articulate it to your, your partner, right? Then talk to them about the difficulties that you're having around maybe the shame or the blame or, or the anxieties uh, that are coming up. Taking a leadership role in your own pleasure is dominance. What do you guys think about that? I am in love with that descriptor of kink and uh, the, the things that you, in, in your sex life and world, uh, that you not only fantasize about, but like that you that you talk about or have normalized for yourself. This is great because what I was associating it with is, I, I've been in the sex toy industry, pleasure products, and um, now with our podcast, like the world of pleasure and sex for almost 12 years now, maybe 13. And to me, I talk about butt plugs, anal, vibrators, sex all the time. And I forget sometimes I'll be at, lunch with Amy or out and talking about sex toys or or my anal beads or we're out of this we're out of <laughs> anal beads right now and then I look around and people are like like oh my God. whoa yeah. oh my God. Like, I, I forget it's taboo for some folks and the thing is there's so much curiosity to learn more and that's why these platforms exist and I just think that your analogy but it's not even an analogy it's like the it's that's fact to me about what you can proclaim kink to be for you and the floggers in your bedroom is is completely normal you're like this is me this is who i am and i think um i think you nailed that mm. that that <laughs> like professor i'm the student you nailed it i'll remember that. <laughs> thank you so much so, thank you so much dynamic already yeah i know <laughs> I was like, Tell me more. so okay let's talk there's let's talk about this this whole toxic masculinity uh, mm. It's been around uh, in, in more conversations these days. What do you think the dominant healthy masculine looks like both in and out of sexuality? Mm, this, this is the one I always get in trouble for. <laughs> but I'm going to say it because I truly believe it. And, and again, I'm going to supply you with uh, the full explanation. Um, here's, the, here's the thing. Masculinity is a barometer by which a society measures what a, what it values in masculine bodied individuals. So let me say that again. Masculinity is a barometer by which a, a society measures what it feels is valuable in its male bodied individuals. Give you an example. You know, uh, the win it all cost attitude, virility, speed, strength, right? Tenacity, all those things that football players have, soldiers are supposed to have, you know, combatants. But when you look at it, the same things that we're fostering in those on, in those behaviors, in those places are great. They will help your son survive a war. They'll help your your people win a football game. They'll help your your guy run farther, jump higher, do all the things, train harder. But it's not the same thing in the bedroom. That same behavior does not make for a good love relationship. And that's actually what we're interpreting as toxic masculinity, the wrong behavior at the wrong time. Mm. Okay, so again, that same jerk that's catcalling, so, you know, hyper, you know, really strong, really in his body, really in his, his thing. That guy usually does great on the battlefield, right? But when you're at home, 
talking to non-combatants, talking to civilians, that behavior doesn't work. So for me, when we talk about healthy masculinity, what I'm saying is I get to dictate what we measure as healthy masculinity. Being a good father, being a good friend, being a good lover, right? Showing up for my people. You know, when you are, are putting up the things that are to be measured, you can't fail. You can't fall short. Right, be the best employee, be an inventor, be an entrepreneur. Make that the barometer by which you're measuring masculinity. You do not have to run, jump, uh, get the most girls. That's a that's a toxic society because if you have toxic masculinity that value, I mean, a toxic society that values that, then it's the society is toxic. It's just not as inhabitants. When one person's sick, they make other people sick. Right, till we're all sick. So we have to get out of this idea that masculinity is a thing. It's not a thing. It's a measurement. And we can measure whatever we want, whatever you like, right? And in that way, there's no failure. What do you guys think? I love the way that you worded that. And I think that when you're you're speaking to, I I like the emphasis on it's what society's um, idea about what masculinity is. And I think that, I, I want to say that I have compassion for people who maybe fall into the toxic ma- masculinity category, just as any of us when we're not being our, I mean, doing air quotes here for real, highest selves, you know, our most mm-hmm. loving selves, our most caring selves. And I like what you said also about, I show up for my people. You know, I, I'm not battling everyone to prove my worth. I'm actually I'm showing up for people. And I think that that's, that's huge. And I think that there's a lot of socially constructed ideas about what it means to be a man or alpha or masculine or strong. And it means you have to dominate and you have to control and manipulate and destroy and conquer and be the number one or the biggest voice in the room uh, when really that's a whole bunch of bullshit. That's just, it's mm-hmm. not, and, and it then, and they don't end up getting what they want in the long run. I mean, maybe they do temporarily. It's kind of like, you know, being a bully, you get what you want for a minute, but ultimately you're still hurting inside. Cause we know that's what you, how you feel bullies. We know that you're just hurting inside. <laughs> um, and so it's, it's kind of like um, people that have been conditioned to just continue to be big, tantrum throwing babies and I, this isn't just the masculine by the way everyone the feminine does it too i'm not and i'm not saying this is just is just men and penis owners i like um, the measurement piece too. yeah totally and right the barometer can we use a thermometer too though yeah thermometer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah definitely it's getting hot. It's getting hot. Yeah. check the temperature on that yeah. one yeah well you, when I, when I, oh well, so when i think of the kink world too and a lot of the dom men that i've seen they have this strong dom to them but then also I could see their bottoms feel very safe with them the people they're working with they feel very cared for so you can still be like either I'm going to punish you and humiliate you but I care about you you know you can still have all that and again you don't have to be a jerk to be a dominant it's funny as soon as people slip into when I see people slipping into role play and they're like oh I'm going to play the dom and you're going to play the sub they slip into jerk right off the bat you know or overbearing or dramatic or you know not caring Right. Being a good leader is being a dominant. Right. Being responsible for the people that you're with is being a dominant. You know, stepping to a position of passion, not worrying about how society views you and stepping into the role that that person needs you to step into. That's leadership. That's good dominance. And for me, it took a long time to step out of this presentation because really what we're doing is we're presenting as dominant. Most people are not dominant. It's just not, just like there's, most people are not shy, you know? So so we got to say, most people are not dominant. They're presenting as dominant. So for me, if we're going, if it's not who you are and you have to fake it, you don't have to fake what you think is the worst parts about it. Hmm. You know what I mean? And it's really important that we understand that the psyche is, is the sexual psyche is revolves around presentation, Um, presentation, suppression, and repression, right? So we present the version of ourselves that we think society wants to see. That's why we try to do the Joneses. That's why we talk about the Smiths. We talk about, you know, looking in someone else's yard, right? But who we are is what we suppress. The bulk of who we are is what we're suppressing. Kink helps you get at that. Because kink is saying, tell me about your real desires, not the things that people told you you want to desire. Right? Tell me what you really want. It's almost like that Lucifer TV show. 
what do you desire? And then they start speaking from that really, that real place, right? And that takes faith and trust, right? Two things that kink, when it's done right, fosters, okay? So I, I don't know if I'm on a tangent. No, I love it. I want to make sure. I yeah. like the, you have these, uh, you also have one that we, we talked about when we had a, a meeting before we were recording about PAC, P-A-C-K, which mm -hmm. I want you to dive into for folks. Cause right. I like these, these, um, well, they're obviously, uh, acronyms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank I you. love They're acronyms. Acronyms. I was going to say an onomatopoeia, but that's not nope. right. <laughs> I love an onomatopoeia. So right. can you, and these are the four keys to things that help folks develop their personal masculine. So can you yes. talk about what does this entail and um, talk about PAC for people and what that is as well, because I love these associations. Thank you so much. Power, authority, creativity, knowledge. Those are the four things that every dominant has to have when they go into this space of dominance. Uh, power means the ability to operate in accordance with your own will and or desire. If you can't advocate on behalf of your own wants, needs, and desires, then you have no power. Right? You cannot go into a sexual situation like, I don't know, uh, whatever you want to do, and think that you're a dominant. You have to search yourself for what you want, what you need, what you crave, what you hunger, what you long and lust for. That is what we're looking for when we're talking about stepping into our power. Authority, right? There's two sides of this coin. One, I'm authorizing someone to act in accordance with their will, to use their will over me, to use me as an extension of their desire. That's one version of authority, right? Well, there's also, too, will you authorize me to use my power over you, right? That's the consent piece. That's the consent piece. Creativity, to not just look at these things as props, the toys, the tropes, right? To really drop in and say, how can I use this as an extension of my sexuality? How can I help this be a conduit by which we better connect and drop deeper into this power dynamic that we've just created, right? And then the final key is knowledge, knowing how to do it all safely, right? Because at the end of the day, to quote Stan Lee, with total power comes total responsibility, you have to have enough knowledge to be able to keep you and your partner emotional, emotionally safe, physically safe, sexually safe, right? That's super important. And so I use PAC as a really easy word of remembering power, authority, creativity, and knowledge. I love that. I think that's really helpful. And uh, PAC backwards, if it was an onomatopoeia, well, it would be PAC, but it's a cat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not an automatic, yeah. but I like this. And I love especially also the consent piece and just is what a responsibility is to be in the authority role um, or the dominant role and um, to not necessarily take that lightly. And I highly suggest and we'll talk later about how people can find you because you have so many offerings and how people can work with you and learn from you. Um, and we shared some in the Bible. We'll share more of that later. But for people to who want to step into this role to really take it seriously and to learn and to gain knowledge. And if you're in a submissive role or any other roles, basically, if you want to just learn. Oh. More yeah. about anything in the kink world, I think uh, knowledge is power. You have knowledge in here, power. right? Oh, power, but we got two of them, and authority, <laughs> and all of the above. Um, so I'm you. You have a really strong spiritual practice. We talked about this before yes. the recordings. We know this about you, and I'm, I'm sure it's in your bio as well. How does this all pertain to sexuality and dominance? How are do sexuality and uh, and spirituality and dominance linked? Like, how do they all relate? Well, you know, one of the main uh, mistakes that people make is to believe that these kink dynamics are rooted in trust. They're not. They're rooted in faith, mm -hmm. belief in the absence of proof. When you first meet somebody knowing that you're going to go into this space, you don't know if they're going to be a psycho killer or if they know how to use the toys or if they have the knowledge to keep you safe. You base it on faith. You want to believe them. You want to go into that fantasy world. You want to have this experience. And that is really interesting because it comes from a very spiritual place a, you know, striving for deep and meaningful connection right and one of the things that we have to remember too on the other spiritual side is that in the hindu version of desire the definition or the sanskrit version is desire comes from a place 
or need to feel complete and whole. So when you bring desire and faith together, belief in the absence of proof, and a deep and need, meaningful need to feel whole, you can see that kink is actually a spiritual place to play because we're coming with our desires, we're coming with faith, right? And we're desiring that connection. We're looking for something that's gonna be that missing piece to what we've always knew was out there. And now this is our opportunity to find it, to become whole. Right, so stepping into that power dynamic with someone who wants to yield, to submit, to be guided, to be led, or you know, being led, having someone guide you, having someone take the initiative, all of that can be a deeply spiritual practice if we just look for it. Right? Yeah, yeah, and I and I think a lot of people think of the kink world as being. Um, really disconnected from deep connection, from oneness. And I remember when I did uh, Barbara Corellis' Urban Tantra's professional, pro Urban Tantra professionals training, it, it was had a big overlap between Tantra and kink. And she right. was talking about how this energetic exchange between two or three or four people in a scene, um, what, even if there's a lot of like, you know, spanking, maybe some piercing play, all kinds of things, where people are experiencing all the pleasures and all the pain and all the power and all, you know, all the things that it can be deeply tantric because one, a, it, it can be very ritualistic. It can be like a celebration of, um, of connection of sexuality, but also there's this oneness there when you're deeply connected there and you're working together, you can feel like you're in this oneness vortex bubble. Um, and, and I thought that was really, really beautiful. And I think for a lot of people who hear Tantra, they're like, la, 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 or spirituality and sex, you know, they might tune out because like, I know I want to keep my spirituality separate from sex. But when we're talking about that, it's, it's beyond like, you know, a God, or you're talking about faith, you're talking about oneness, you're talking about deep felt connection beyond just us as these individual bodies, which is so lonely and isolating, by the way, like, why not choose mm -hmm. to, to access it from this other place? So does that kind of resonate with what you're talking about? Definitely, definitely. I, I feel like Tantra is the energetic component while kink is like that primal practice, right? There's the energetic component, there's a primal practice. And think about it, mortification, what we're doing is mortifying the body to achieve a higher state of being, right? So you have people who have historically self-flagellated, pierced, right? Punctured, bled, right? To attain a higher state of being. We're doing the same thing, right? It's, it's, it's a primal practice to get us more in touch with our instincts, our drives, right? And the best thing about kink is that it puts a process between urge and action, right? Without that, we call that sublimation, right? So if, if you have a guy who has a foot fetish, and you'll see this in Al Bundy, Married with Children, right? He's a foot fetishist, right? He has a foot fetish. He doesn't want to talk to his wife. He doesn't want to talk to anybody. And then he sees a job. Oh, I can start selling shoes? Like, I need a job. Why not? Right? I, I can do that. And then he starts doing these things. And you've seen episodes with him doing inappropriate things with women's feet in his shop. Right? And he doesn't think he's doing anything. Right? But... The same thing, when we put negotiation in, we're putting a process in between urge and action. When we talk about safe words, we're putting a process in between urge and action. We're not going into this willy-nilly. That's another component. When we look at mortification, there's a purpose behind the mortification because the, whatever faith they're a part of says, here's the practice, here's the meditation, here's the prayer, here's the way your body's supposed, here's when you know you're going too far. Now do the practice, and when the chanting is done, you're done. Or when you've reached this point, it's over. We do the same thing when we go into the space of, uh, what's your safe word? What is negotiation? Uh, there's, we're going to play for an hour, and then we're going to stop, and then we're check in. We have all those breaks. When you don't, when you're trying to do kink or deviate without those specific processes, it can go horribly wrong. Right? And so we can see them likened to other mortifications we can see them other uh spiritual practices all being one thing this is just the most sensational i feel like you're the um master that like you have like 
jumped in the, the matrix of kink, right? It's like <laughs> you can see all the things capture the bullets mid right. And, uh, I love that. It's, I, I mean, that's just my analogy. I was like, wow, you really have this like the foundation to the mm. roof of the home to the trees planted about this, mm -hmm. this uh, like the the dominance and the kink world and of course i'm sure you're a, a student as well w w with right. all of the things because nothing is ever linear the most humble teachers are still students they uh, of course yeah. of course yeah. um and that is not a question that was just my <laughs> observation <laughs> so, <laughs> so because you are so knowledgeable and have been deep in this work and this practice um uh, can you share any, la and you have so much to share, and of course, <laughs> we are going to let folks know how to work with you because you are so incredible. Uh, can you just share any last minute juicy tips or um, something, uh, some more wisdom with our listeners, mm. especially in ter in, in who, if they want to bring in more dominance and Mm -hmm. Most of our listeners, and I don't want to generalize, but I believe um, from our from our knowledge, they're a, a lot more beginners or intermediate folks. So, mm -hmm. um, how can they? If you have any tips for those folks, you have shared some. But yeah. Any more? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. I think one of the one of the hardest things to do is to play without toys. Right. These are all props and it's easy to hide behind the hitting, the smacking, the pulling, the the process. We really have to get into the presence. How do I show up? How do I take a person who's just come home from work? Right. Who's who's struggling with the kids, go into a bedroom and change the entire dynamic. One of the ways you can do that is actually with role play. Right. Actually using ro stepping into roles to help people get out of their heads and into a space. Now I'm going to give you four keys to do successful role play, right? Well, first, outside of that, I forgot to set this up. Uh, first, find a role that's in line with your desires, right? If you're into uh, medical play, be a doctor or a patient, right? If you're, if you're into, you know, stringent law or something like that, be a lawyer. If you like harsh punishment, be a, gu a guard or a, a warden. Whatever it is, find something that's in line with your desires. Then use this acronym, LAMP. Language, attire, mannerisms, presence. Right. You have to use the language that the character would use. You have to dress in the attire that the person would use. You have to display the mannerisms that that person would have. And then you have to be completely present in the role. Hmm. Right. When you can do that, it's easier for a person to shift out of the reality and into the fantasy. It's it's like if I'm wearing jeans and a T-shirt, yeah, I'm speaking in a Victorian tone. It's like it's not congruent. Right. I have to put on something reminiscent of that. Right. So I have the language and the attire. But I can't just have the attire. I also have to have the mannerisms maybe of a French nobleman or what I think a king would wear or what I think a duke or marquis de Sade would have. Right. And then I have to put on all the pomp. Be present. Drop completely in. Make that eye contact, lead, guide, shift them through the space. And that way you can get more out of the role play, stepping into the role of a dominant character if you can't just be dominant yourself. Right. And it's important to note that you can start with the role. An archetype will emerge and it will harden into identity. That's how a kid who maybe uh, laid some pipe for a summer, starts fine, oh, I actually like this and I can get into it and then they become a plumber, <laughs> right? <laughs> right, the role existed first and it's, the, it's role play until it becomes the role you play. So right? I'm gonna act like Mick Jagger, put on my crushed velvet bell there bottoms. And I'm gonna fucking yeah. dance around and sing some Rolling Stones because that is who I would fantasize about being. Such a but you know what? It's more than the singing, though. It's about that Jagger swagger, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? He's like 90 years old. He's just like, yeah, he's still got it, man. He yeah, it. man. Show, it, show up. Move your body. 
you know, do the lip thing that he does, right? Do everything that is reminiscent of that person. I used to invoke Prince. Like, when I was a kid, when I, was, when I wanted to get the ladies, you know what I mean? I would drop into my big Prince space and try and sing some of the songs and really drop into Prince because, for me, he was like my, my sexual spirit animal. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I invoke genius perp that whole that oh my god that movie that whole yeah. vibe. Oh my god! And, yeah, and you gotta think I'm a big guy. Like this don't look good in high heels. <laughs> you know what I mean, but for me, it helped me drop into the space so I can show up in that type of leadership role in that scene, hmm. right? And and as you can see, that was prior to this, but I wound up becoming this. I wound up dropping into the sexual space. It was role play until it was the role I played. Now I love being this. I, I mean, I get to live my Prince fantasies every day, you know, with all the clothes and all the, you know, the attire. And I, I may have three beautiful subs, you know what I mean? And two of them, you know, uh, two are here now. And I have my childhood sweetheart who sleeps in the other room. And I've got four other girlfriends. I'm living my best life. But it started because it started as a role. And then it became my role. Right. And it wasn't about the singing. It wasn't about the dancing. It was about the charisma. It was about the confidence. You know, it was also about the responsibility that I saw him take on, it, you know, because he led the whole show. You know, he was out front, but he was always with his band. He was always supporting his other members. You know, there was something with him as a leader that really rang out for me. So you have to find that for yourself. When you're trying to step into that role of dominance, what is it that this character is bringing to this incident, incident, uh, this instance? Excuse me. And I like that part about authenticity, right? Like, so just because someone else is like your character that you'd like to take on would be Prince, is it doesn't mean that that will apply to someone else. It's, it's also like what's true to us. And I like you said mm -hmm. that in the beginning, kind of feeling like what what do I really identify with, and, and how how would it, can I take on that role? I thought you were gonna commend me for Mick Jagger. Oh, Mick Jagger's awesome. <laughs> I, 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 I want you. Can okay. you be my Mick Jagger Dom, please? That sounds really fun. I would have would do with Aerosmith. I thought that would Ooh. fit a little Ooh. more Steven for you. Steven Tyler. Yeah. Steven Tyler. Oh. And, okay. and, and I'm talking about come together over me, Steven oh, Tyler. Shit. Like when he was really dirty and grinding the microphone and Ooh. you know what I mean. That hair Super. Just and all the like, all of the scarves hanging off the microphone, mm -hmm. and him like humping out the. Okay, that's what right. I'm talking about. Fair and that's my dog all those yeah. things, for bondage, that's what the scarves are for. I'm quite sure. I yes. just, I've just always seen it like that. Just really into bondage. <laughs> just going on there. They feel nice on the wrists and all those things too. They do. So, our, so our listeners probably are like, how do I get more of Orpheus in my life? How do I learn more from this wonderful teacher who will always be a student? Um, so mm. how can people find you, learn from you, work with you? What kind of offerings do you have? We want all the links, all the things. <laughs> oh, you have a quiz too, oh, right? A quiz. Yes, yeah. I do have a, a again, this is for, as you say, cock owners. Uh, we're, we're having more tests coming out, and this is a dominant archetype assessment tape. It's uh, test. It's based on Jungian principles. And uh, you can go to my website and fill it out. 100% free and it will give you the dominant archetype that you most identify with and on the bottom it will give the one that you least identify with so not only what you're already doing but what you should be striving toward mm -hmm. right so it's great so you can go to orpheusblack.com look on the main page and just click dominant archetype assessment test and that's something you can do you can also take one-on-one -on -one classes via zoom with me and, uh, you know, those are great classes. We got great eight week classes and we have also intensives. So you can do month long uh, intensives with me and then meet me in person for scenes and for hands on coaching for either you and, or you and your partner. And this is all through your website that they can all find through you? my website. Okay. Orpheusblack.com. We'll, we'll make sure we post that uh, yeah. on our show notes uh, in, on our website. I love quizzes. I love quizzes, <laughs> too, because you learn a lot about yourself. And sometimes you aren't necessarily understanding those portions of yourself. Or maybe it is clear to you. But I always learn something when I take these kinds of quizzes. So, um, yeah. But as a, uh, is this only for penis owners, you said? Or cock owners? That's if It lands... <laughs> it lands harder for people who are cock owners, right? Uh, but I also tell people, like, if you take it and then just go all the way to the end and read the archetypes, 
to see like the four versions of dominance, you know, and see what you could be looking for in a partner. It gives you great insight into the psyche of leadership of dominant individuals. And you can also see the shadow side, like how, like maybe some warning signs of bad behavior, or bad domination. Wow, that's incredible. Thank mm-hmm. you so much, mm-hmm. Orpheus, for being here with us, for sharing your wisdom. And Thank if you. you haven't accessed this podcast, it's also available on YouTube, y'all. We are still <laughs> up so you can see the man right here mm-hmm. behind the curtain. It's not a curtain at all, but you, know, <laughs> you can actually see him it's as great. well as his beautiful flogging, paddling room, the bat cave. But with I make all those, pillows. by the way. Oh, Just wow. Just saying. Oh. So if anybody's interested, I make all that. I make everything. Collars. Awesome. Specialty it's your, only. It's on your website, too? Uh, or no, special order. specialty okay. only. Oh. Specialty only. I, even, <laughs> I, lo- I just love hanging out with you. I don't yeah. want you to go. I'm like, can you just? Have <laughs> <I'll> have <two laughs> subs, can we come over to your house right now? Yeah, we'll, we'll be right. Soon. Yeah. Anytime. You know what? And my wife is a chef, so if you ever come over, I will do dinner. I will do you know some kind of lobster or something well, like that. We'll, we'll do a wine. really high end meal. We shall yeah, you bring got- the yeah. wine, yeah. Orpheus. Okay, you, it, with your new sponsor, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, go. actually, she, Margins Wine has been a sponsor for almost three years now, yeah. since mm. almost the beginning. Uh, this podcast has been out since 2017, and we love Megan Bell, who is the vintner, as they say. Maybe that's what I'll embody in my, when I'm doing my uh, role play. I'll be like, I'm a vintner, <laughs> stepping on these grapes right here, yes. naked. But I don't yes. think Megan Step does Step on it. my grapes. She's definitely stepping Step on the grapes. Clothes on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if you want to check out why Amy and I love Margins Wine, go to Margins Wine. Com. She is small batch boutique wine, very eloquently made, and uh, actually she's in Santa Cruz, and we love supporting our local winemakers. So uh, if you want to save some money too, who doesn't want to save some money? You go to Shameless X 10 when you uh, check out with three or more bottles, and you'll save 10%. Shameless X 15 will save you 15% off six or more bottles. Marginswine.com. Just sign up for the newsletter, y'all. All right, Orpheus. That was my last bit of things before I say I do mm. to you. And I know we will see you soon because you're just an absolute joy. And we're coming over for lobster. And we're coming over lobster. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> and I can't wait for that. So thank you all for being part of the Shameless Sex Revolution. We'll see you next Tuesday. Ciao for now.